I want to I want to conclude our series uh, today on heal our land. Heal our land. It's a heal our land part three. I think most of us would agree that our land needs some healing. I think most of us would agree that our country needs some healing. I think most of us agree that the church needs some healing. It's not just relegated to political circles, but even in the body of Christ, we need healing. We need healing. So we've been pulling our series from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and we've been staying right here, right here in this verse, and we've just been breaking it down. And so I'm going to go just a little bit further today, and, and uh, this one's going to be exciting for you. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, this is where we are today, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. We're going to talk about that today. <laughs> Everyone's like, uh, can we skip, skip that part? It says, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. He gives us, in this text, the conditions, what were then for the, for the temple uh, that, that they were consecrating. Solomon was consecrating the temple, and they were asking for the glory of God to come and fill that temple. And this is what God gives them, and what that instruction that was given to them then, I believe is still applicable today. It lines up with New Testament covenant theology that says that when we hear from, when we humble ourselves and pray, when we seek God, and we turn from our wicked ways, then God, then God, then God hears from heaven, and he will heal our land. Can, can, I, can I just say this from the outset, that nothing is beyond the healing power of our God? That, that no relationship is outside the healing power of our God. That no body is outside the healing power of our God. That no finances are outside the healing power of our God. That no parental relationship, that no, that no marriage relation, nothing is outside the healing power. That's good news. It's outside the healing power of our God. But there's these conditions that the scripture talks about, and we've been talking about them. That if my people who are called by my, did you know we're God's people? That should come with some confidence. That should come with some authority. That should come with some attitude that says, I belong to God. And because I belong to God, I don't have to come to God perfect. Because I belong to God, everything that I am and everything that I have and everything that comes with me belongs to God as well. I belong to God, so this belongs to God. If I'm going through a storm, I belong to God and the storm belongs to God. Because whatever belongs to Him... It's not exclusive of my issue. I belong, to, I belong to him and all that I am belongs to him. I don't have to put a front or put a mask on, a facade. I just get to come to God just as I am. Because I belong to God, this belongs to God. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. And this is what we need more than ever is a movement of God's people. That begin to pray. I said it last week that we even begin to pray more than we, than we post. That even more than we talk about an issue, that we pray about an issue. And we talked about how do we pray? We find God's promises and we pray God's promises. This week, literally this week, I begin to look in the word of God and I was finding promises. And I begin to quote God's word back to him. Hey, God, remember you said that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Remember you said I'm more than a conqueror. Remember you. I'm just reminding him, just in case he forgot, I'm praying what he said. What he said. We must pray God's promises until they become our reality. It's not a checkoff list. I pray it until it happens. I pray it until it comes into my reality. I pray it until it becomes my reality. God's promises brought into my world become my reality with unrelenting prayer. Prayer that won't give up. And then it says, and, and seek my face. And seek my face. I, I found something to be true when I was young. My dad, he, uh, he, he likes things done a certain way. 
You've heard about my dad before, but my dad's famous for saying there's a place for everything and everything in its place. That's right. That's how life should be lived, a place for everything and everything in its place. And I have inherited his personality traits, and I believe in this. And, and I think this was the turning point for me is one day uh, I was out, and, and my dad, when he would mow the lawn, it was like therapeutic for him. He'd be out there mowing the grass, and he'd just, just peacefully, you know, just... Just, just, but, but, but he had this like kind of like swagger when he mowed the lawn. It was just like, this is my yard, and I will mow it. This is my grass. This is my place. I was like, man, I like that, Dad. I like seeing you just like walk with authority like that, man. And so I said, hey, Dad, can I mow the grass? He said, no, son. So this is my job. The lines have to be straight. And I'm like, well, I think I could do it. And, uh, and he said, no, 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 no. No, no, this is, this is my, now, now I understand he was manipulating me. All right, now I got it. I, I got it now. But then I'm like, Dad, please let me mow the lawn. Please, Dad, just one time. One time he's gone to work and I got the lawnmower. I started it up and I said, I'm going to show him. And so I got out there and I was mowing and I kept on, you know, watching to make sure. I, and I, I got down one whole line and I looked back. And it seemed to me that every time that I had looked back, I had, I had wavered. And I'm thinking, he's, he's going to kill me. So I tried to do it again, and I went slow. But every time that I looked at where I'd been, I deviated from the track I was on. And my dad got home, and I expected him to be mad at me, which he was frustrated. Not mad, frustrated. That's how he'd like to describe it. I'm not mad, son. I'm frustrated. Isn't that the same thing? So he says, when you're mowing the lawn, if you really want to know, I'm going to show you. When you're mowing the lawn, you have to keep your eyes fixed on where you are going. He said, if you look back, you will waver. So I studied his approach. And there was a day when he crowned me. The now, I, I, I was in charge of mowing the yard. And then about three months into it, I'm like, that was not right. <laughs> he, he pulled one over on me because now, I, I'm like, Dad, can you mow the lawn? And, no, son, that's your job. You asked for that. Like, okay. You know, I learned a valuable lesson is that you move where you look. You, 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 you move where you look. That the things that you look at have a gravitational pull for your spirit, for your soul, for your mind. That you begin to move towards the things that you look at. And you can say it's not true all you want. But if you look back, you'll waver. If you look back, if you focus your eyes on something, you will move towards it. It's, it's just the way that we're wired. It's the way that we work. Did you know you never bought something that you haven't seen first? Well, no, I saw it online. You saw it online? Yeah, because your seeing created some type of value system or desire for it. You become what you behold. What you look at, you gravitate towards. You will move in the direction that you constantly look. I would propose to this in this time in history more than ever before. We have to be very careful where we look, what we look at, and how long we look at it. Because if you're not careful, you will gravitate towards the thing you're looking at. If you are reading and watching Things that are negative, that are oppressive, that are damaging to your mind and to your heart, you will begin to gravitate towards that. If you stare at pain long enough, you will begin to live out of your pain. And you can get mad all you want. It's just proof that it's true. That when you stare at it long enough, you become it. That's why the Bible says, seek my face hidden in the scripture that is talking about the healing of our land is a command to lift up your 
eyes. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? To lift up your eyes from where you are. You start looking in the Bible at every time the Bible talks about what you do with your eyes. That your eyes are the window to the soul. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Set your eyes straight before you. Look at the word and see what it says about our eyes. There's an old Sunday school song. Old Sunday school song. I was about to sing it. Maybe. It says, be careful little eyes. Right? Anybody know it? Be careful little eyes what you see. What you see. For your father up ahead above is looking down in love. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. And then it goes on like through your whole body. It's like, be careful big toe what you do. You know, it's like, okay, it's gone too far. Be careful little eyes what you see. What you see. Psalm. 119 verse 37, it says, turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Lord, turn my eyes. Turn is an interesting word. Turn is a word that is hidden in the meaning of repentance. Repent actually means to turn. It actually, in one of the definitions, it means I'm going one way, and it means to turn 180 degrees around and to go the other direction. When we think of repentance, we think of groveling before God. We think of telling him all of the things, bad things we've done, and then the punishment that's going to come on us because of the bad that we have done. Repentance is not as bad as it sounds. Repentance is about changing your mind. It is about changing the direction that you're going in. It it, it is about, I was going one way, I was doing one thing, and now I'm going a different way, and I'm going, I'm doing something different. The Bible says to seek, this is all a part of it, it says to seek my face. There's a difference between looking and seeking. Looking has a passive approach. That I, I looked at that. I watched a car wreck. You don't seek a car wreck. You observe, that's what look has the connotation of, I'm observing something. Seek has the connotation, I'm pursuing something. There's a difference. There's a difference between observing God and pursuing God. There's a lot of people that sit in church and observe God. And because of that, they have a Christian title and a Christian label. And they can tell you all the Christian things. And they can combat your theology and tell you why you're wrong. But they've been observing God. And they've never sought God. Because if you look at all the things that are wrong long enough, you live in the world that is wrong. <laughs> Seek. It means to actively search out. Psalm 27, 4, one thing I ask from the Lord, and this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze, to look on the beauty of the Lord, and to seek him in his temple, to seek the Lord, and turn from their wicked ways, is the second part of the scripture, and turn from their wicked ways. What are wicked ways? Let's just think about that for a second. What are wicked ways? I think sometimes we get our morals convoluted in this day and age because someone says something about something and we think, oh, that's wrong, or this is that, or that is this. What is wrong? You know what I like to do? I like to look at the fruit of life. You know what the fruit of the Spirit is? Love. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness gentleness, self-control. Does that sound like the people you're following? Because if it's not, then you need to do a fruit check and you might need to do a, 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 a course correction to what you're looking at. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. What is the fruit? Where is the fruit? If you are full of bitterness and full of poison, full of vengeance, looking and wishing for the demise of others, that's not fruit. Friends, that's poison. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we should be able to recognize, identify, and refute the poison that tries to come in the pure and simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Where is the love? Where's the love? It says, turn from your wicked. What are wicked ways? Wicked ways is sin. What's sin? 
You know what? A simple definition of sin, it's missing the mark. Doesn't that make it sound a little easier for you? It's like, oh, I just missed the mark. Bummer. You just missed the mark. It's okay. It's not okay to sin, but sin is missing the mark. Why do we need repentance? Because we all miss the mark. Why do we need to turn away from wicked ways? Because we all, sounds like a scripture, for all have missed the mark and fall short of the glory of God, which is why we needed Jesus. That's why we need the gospel. That's why we need the cross. That's why we need the blood, because all of us have missed the mark. I've missed the mark. You've missed the mark. We've all missed it. You think about what is wrong. wrong. What are wrong ways? What is sin? It's anything outside of what we know to be the law or the heart of God which all of us deviate from probably every day. Oh, I'm a sinner. I'm so bad. I'm not trying to make you feel bad because I'm going to help you in a second. Some of you are in habits and rhythms of sin, addiction, of pain, of, of bitterness, of unforgiveness that today you're going to get set free, free from because of one hidden clue that's hidden inside this scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And when you see it, it's going to set you free because I would propose to you that most of you have been taught almost all your life to just get more discipline and stop your sinning. Grin and parrot, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop, stop it right now. And then you try and you try, and the more you look at it, the more you do it, and the more you look at it, the more you do it, and the more, which is why in the scripture it doesn't say, look at your sin and rebuke it. It says, seek me. Seek. It never says, turn from your wicked way until my focus is on him. And when my eyes are on him, my life and my behavior begins to follow. I don't have to look at the sin and say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. Because I am elevating and exalting that thing by giving it attention that it doesn't deserve. Did you know under the new covenant and the grace of Jesus Christ how you walk in freedom is not just by more self-control? And I believe in self-control and I believe in self-discipline. I believe in accountability. But you know what it really is about? It's about your focus. It's about what your look. You know what religion says? Religion says do better. Do better. Come on. You're an idiot. You're a sinner. Do better. And you're like trying to do it. And you feel pressure. And you walk in because you had a crazy weekend. And so you walk in to church. And you feel all the pressure. You're watching online. You feel all the condemnation. And what you really should do is get your eyes off of that. And get your eyes on to him. Well, what about the sin? No, he said turn from your wicked ways. But it has to be prefaced with a change of focus. And when I, fo- I, mean, I feel the spirit of God. When, when I focus on him, it changes everything about my life. I can't look at him and stay the same. I can't look at him and curse you. I can't look at him and lust. I can't look at him and gossip. I can't look at him and slander. I can't look at him and wish bad on somebody. When I look at him, I become like him. That's, 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 that's why the Bible says, seek my face. And some of us jump over that and we're like, turn from your wicked ways or burn. This whole church is built around that theology. Turn or burn. No, I seek his face, which enables me to get more obsessed with this than I am with that. And so when I become more obsessed with this than I am with that, I begin to become like this and gravitate towards this. Where are you looking? Some of us, we're we're doing this with Jesus. And every time you're looking back, did I, oops, did I, you, you, you waver. And what I'm trying to challenge us with is that my behavior is a byproduct of my focus. The turning of our life has to be preceded by the changing of our focus. The word for repent in the Greek is metanoia. Metanoia. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. 
which is where we, the word for transformation, which is where when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it goes through a metamorphosis. It transforms. Another simple term is it is the process of becoming an adult. Whoa. I, did, I didn't expect that one to hit like it did, but it hit, didn't it? That, that repentance is the process of becoming an adult. I missed the mark, but Lord, my focus is on you. My focus is on you. My focus. You know what James chapter 4, verse 7 says? It says, submit yourself. Now, you're going to see this progression all over in Scripture now. Watch this. Submit yourselves then to God. Everyone's like, uh-huh, get to the good stuff. <laughs> Resist the devil, and he will flee. We're like, oh, I like that. I like that devil beating stuff. <laughs> the devil beating stuff is impossible without the first command, which is to submit to God. Do you, do you see? Seek God and turn from your wicked ways. That empowers this. Now, watch this. Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Why does he flee? Because I'm submitted to God. You see it all, you, you, the Bible's going to come alive to you now because you're going to see this everywhere. God always prefaces it with the empowerment to do. And religion finds all the do's and says, oh, you better do this and do this and do this. And we don't realize that grace gives us the empowerment to do all of those things. It's not grace gives me self-control. Grace adjusts my focus to a place of worship and gratitude. And when I'm so obsessed with this, I don't even worry about that the order matters it's impossible to turn from sin if you don't first seek his face it's impossible to turn from sin if you don't first seek his face many of us are good at lamenting but very bad at repenting lamenting says i grieve that i got caught and i grieve that it happened repenting says it happened and i'm turning how do you turn you change what you focus on. Lamenting says look at it. Repenting says look at him. Lamenting says you're bad. Repenting says God, you're good. Look at this. Look at this process. It's so free. God, you're so good. Why is he so good? Because he sent Jesus to die, to forgive my sins. And now I live in the grace that has been provided to me, which provides gratitude in my heart, and I get more obsessed with him. And the more obsessed I get with him, the less this stuff can get to me. Every time that I get confused, discouraged, down, sidetracked, is because I'm looking at the wrong thing. Because I'm looking at the wrong thing. There's three rules of seeking that I kind of follow in my life and I've seen throughout the scripture, and it's this. What I look at, I drift towards. There is a gravitational pull that what I look at, I will begin to drift towards. The only long-lasting turn or change comes from changing what you're focused on. This is why some people wonder, they wake up one day and say, how did I get here? You got here by looking at it. You, you got here by looking at it. You stare at it long enough, and you become it. Sometimes the things we despise, we actually become. Ask children of abusive fathers. I will never be. I will never be. And then a tendency to be. Because we've looked at it. We've despised it. We've hated it. Do you know what would turn our action? Catching a glimpse of our heavenly father who loves without measure and without manipulation. Woo! Man, I feel the presence of God. It's His love. It's His grace. You see how we can get so heavy in our Christian lives? Because we lament. Turn from your wicked ways. And we lament and we're heavy. When I come into pr the presence of God, I, got, I, can, I, I just can barely contain myself because I know I'm wrong. I know I've missed the mark, but the more I look at him, the more I see his face. The more I see his face, I experience his grace. The more I experience his grace, gratitude overcomes my, my life, and the more I worship him, it just it changes everything. Every deviation of my life has been a lack of focus 
or a misappropriated gaze, a misappropriated look, seeking the wrong thing. What I look at, I drift towards. What I look at, I desire. This is what advertisers have down pat, right? They know if, you can, if, you, if they put it in front of you, if they put it in front of you. I have a bag right now, right now, that I was on Instagram one day. And I'm on Instagram, and this ad comes across my, I've never seen this bag, never heard of this brand, anything. I'm like, what? That looks nice. And so I talked about it. They're listening, always. <laughs> I talked about it. Sure enough, I started getting more ads. I'm like, well, man, this is a sign. I have to have it, and I'm looking at it. Now I, go, now I went to the website. I've taken a step further now. Not just looking at the ad. Now I've stepped into the ad, and now I'm looking at it. I'm looking at the different colors, the different variations, the different sizes. So after that, I told Bianca, I said, man, I, I got to have this bag. Man, I, I'm looking at this thing. Man, I'm going I'm, I'm to get this bag, and, and, and sure enough, I, I've got it. <laughs> That's the process of looking i never seen it before in my life, and I never had a desire to have it until I saw it. I, you don't desire something you have not seen. I just desire some what? What? And trace it back. When did you see her? Oh, no, no, that's, that's how that works too. That's why you desire her. That's why you desire him, because you've been looking. And if you get off of their Facebook profile... And focus on what you have. That's too much, right? Just, just back out of that slowly. Back out of that slowly. Just leave it over there. That's how it happens. That's why people say, well, it doesn't matter. It's just a look. A look that creates a desire. You got to be careful what you look at. You got to be careful what you watch. You gotta be careful the things that you read and the, the shows that you watch that they don't form a framework of thinking that you think is truth, but it's a framework that you've created by what you've seen. You desire, you what, what I look at, I de desire. The desires of my heart are exposed by where I direct my focus. What I look at, I depend on. See, you, you can tell really what you depend on by where you look when you get hit. So I can say, man, I'm focused on Jesus. My eyes are on Jesus. And then you get hit by life. A pandemic hits the world. Where do you look? Oh, God, my job. Oh, hold on. Hold on. You were looking at him a minute ago. But we really see what we value. We really see what we lean on. When, tr when the boat starts shaking, what do you grab? I'll, I'll, I'll prove it to you as we close. All right. In Matthew chapter 14, this, what, this, I, I love this because Peter is, is one of my favorite characters in the Bible, probably because I resemble some of his mistakes. Uh, I wanted to say like preaching on the day of Pentecost. No, I don't know. Peter is always sticking his foot in his mouth. He was saying things he shouldn't say. So I'm like, yeah, Peter, I got you. Um, Matthew chapter 14, Peter's in the boat. Y'all know this story. He's in the boat. Disciples are in the boat. Jesus comes walking on the water. He's probably got my dad swagger like when he's mowing the lawn. He's just, you know, Jesus is just, just strolling, just strolling. And Peter's like, is that you? Jesus is like, yes. <laughs> Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come to you. Tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus is like, still me. Come on out. Peter gets out of the boat. We know, we know the story. He starts walking on the water. Whoa. Can you imagine that? You ever tried this? I have, but then I'm like, oh, I'm just trying to jump in. <laughs> Peter's walking on the water. The other disciples are like, oh, that dude's done some stuff, but man, look at him now. My goodness. I mean, he's just, Peter's just got the lawnmower swag, just just going on the water. He's like, man. And it says the, the wind and the waves were blowing a little bit. So he, well, let me just read it to you just to prove it. Verse 29 says, come, he said. Then Peter got down on the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he, when he saw the wind, wait, he saw it? He saw the wind. He was afraid. 
What was he afraid of? The wind. Why the wind? Because he looked at it. He looked at the wind, and he got scared of it. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus, because he's so good, reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Now, did he doubt? I mean, really, did he doubt? Y'all are like, yes, he did, Pastor. <laughs> yes, he did. We looked. I don't know if he, I don't know if he doubted. I wouldn't say that he, there's no evidence that he doubted, except that he sank. And the only reason that he sank was because of what he saw. And what he saw was the wind and waves coming at him. Woo! Man, I feel the power of God. Sometimes you got to preach to yourself. I'll tell you, I'm preaching myself straight up happy right now. I'm going to do a Pentecostal lap around this building. I'm going to run through your TV screen. Woo! I was made for this. I was made for this. Sometimes you got to look the devil in the eye and say, I'm still here. Sometimes you got to look your past square in the face and say, I'm still here. I'm still standing. Not because I'm good, but because he's good. Why don't about 50 people lift up a shout of praise like your God will save your life. Why don't we just change, change, change our focus? Whoa, somebody's going to get set free today. Somebody's getting set free today. I feel that somebody's getting set. Somebody's watching is getting set free today. I'm telling you right now. Why? Why? It's not because of something we do, something we say. I'm jumping and screaming. It's not because of that. It's because of a change of direction. A change of focus. Peter saw the wind. You ever seen the wind coming at you? You ever seen the waves coming? It's real. He was walking on something he shouldn't have walked on. It was real. And he really sank when he doubted. So your fear is not, un, your fear is not unfounded. It's real. They're really coming for you. Your life is really in danger. The economy is scary. Our world is scary. But it's not what holds you up. When I look at him, that's what Peter, Peter got the lawnmower swag all the way to Jesus until he saw. Until he saw. <sighs> what are you looking at that's robbing you of your faith? What are you looking at that's robbing you of your joy? What are you looking at that's robbing you of your call? What are you looking at that's robbing you of your God-given talents and gifts? What are you looking at? This is a call to change our focus. This is a call to change the direction of what we're looking at and to look at Him. I'm about to lawnmower swag all the way through my next week. Just all the way down because I look at him. No matter what the wind, no matter what the wave, no matter what the trial, no matter what the post, no matter what the opposition. I got my eyes. I got my eyes on you.